Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the special music. It was very nice. Well, in Sabbath school, I had a quiz. And those of you who weren't in this class, I don't want to disappoint you. So I'll give you a quiz as well. It won't be about pop it won't be about potato chips. So you want you missed out. So let's try a multiple choice question. If you could be any one of these four, who would you choose to be? The richest and most successful business person of the world? Or most popular and most beautiful movie star? Or three, President of the United States? Or four, an AIDS orphan in South Africa? You got them? Which did you choose? Did anybody choose an AIDS orphan in South Africa? Nobody chose them. Pardon? Less than the four of us. Well, if you know me well enough, you know it's a trick quiz. So let me change the question. If you chose A, B, or C, the, the richest businessman, the most beautiful movie star of the President of the United States, but you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but if you chose the AIDS orphan and you do know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, does that change the question? Yes. yes. Pardon? Yes. Let me illustrate with a story about a song. George Beverly Shea was 20 years old. He was working for an insurance company, and he, he had an offer from a radio station to sing secular songs. Part of his dilemma was he wasn't sure how secure his job would be. Things were getting tough in the country. And he was wrestling. And so he sat down at the piano to practice a song that he was going to sing for, ch for church. And his mother had received a poem from a lady named Mrs. Miller. And the words of the poem were, I'd rather have Jesus. He sat down and she put that poem on the piano. And he started practicing his song until his eyes caught that piece of paper. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. Now, his mother knew that Beverly was a Christian. And she wanted to do whatever she could to help impact him to be very committed to Christ. As he read those words, his fingers stopped playing the tune that he was practicing. And the Lord gave him a new tune for a song that millions love, I'd rather have Jesus. Do you see what I'm asking you? How much do you value Jesus? Is knowing Jesus worth more to you than all the money that Bill Gates has? Is knowing him worth more than all the fame of any actor or actress? See, the central theme of the 14th chapter of the book of Mark is, how much do you value Jesus? Now, there are five characters in this 14th chapter. There are the chief priests. They're the people that you always avoid because they're always going to pick a fight. And then there's the unnamed woman. And of course, there's Judas. And then there's Simon the leper. And then the other disciples. Verses 1 through 11 of Mark 14 are, is divided into three scenes. And so as we read these passages, think about what is their purpose? What is the purpose of each of these individuals 
found in these few verses. What is their gold? How much do they value Jesus? And as you're pondering that, how much do you value Jesus? Now remember, chapter 14 of the book of Mark, it's the last week of Jesus' life. From the beginning of his ministry, he has been in conflict with the priests. Remember, he has traced the money changers out. He has blamed the problems of the church on the priests. And in chapter 13, he prophesied the destruction of the temple of Israel. So we go to scene 1, verses 1 and 2 of Mark 14. Now the Passover and unleavened bread was two days off. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. They were saying, not during the festival, lest there be a riot. Now the Passover was the most popular festival attended. Some scholars project that there are probably over a million people who would come into Jerusalem just for this festival. And the priest said, we will not touch Jesus during the festival, not because they were trying to protect the sanctity of the festival, because they didn't want to riot on their hands. They didn't want people angry at them for doing the evil that was in their heart. In fact, as you read the uh, Acts of the Desire of Ages, chapter 62. Not only were they planning on killing Jesus, they were planning on killing Lazarus. Because they knew as long as he was alive, people would still believe in the words of Jesus. So that's the first scene, the priests. The second scene, Jesus, the disciples, and this unnamed woman. Verse 3. And while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very caustic perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarked to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? That's an important word in this text. Why was it wasted? But some were in Verse 5, for this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. The NIV says they rebuked her harshly. But in verse 6, Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed for me. Verse 7, for the poor you have always with you, and whatever you wish you can do to them, but you can do them good, but you do not always have me. Verse 8, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand. For what purpose? For burial. Now, it's important to realize that because when this unnamed woman came, she understood that Jesus was going to die soon and she wanted to anoint his body. But the people around were saying, no, no, no. He's going to Jerusalem to be anointed as the king of Israel. And so she was excited. And Jesus says, she did this for my burial. Verse 9, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that also which this woman has done shall be spoken in memory of her. Imagine the scene. They're, they're eating at Simon's house. Now, he's not just called Simon, is he? Of all the terrible things you could, you could connect a person with, Simon the leper. <coughs> Simon the leper who Jesus had healed. And Simon's home's in Bethany. Who else lives in Bethany? Yeah, Mary, Lazarus, and Martha. They also live. In fact, Simon's related to them. 
He's their uncle. And during the meal, while everybody's eating and talking and enjoying themselves, this unnamed woman gets up. She opens the jar. She not opens it. She breaks the, the jar open. And the whole room is filled with, her, with this aroma. And rather than putting a small amount on Jesus' head, she pours out all of the oil. And she was shocked by the harshness of the criticism. Now, hold your finger in Mark 14 and flip over to Luke chapter 7, verse 39. Because Luke gives us an insight as to what's going on. Luke chapter 7 and verse 39. So here's Simon the leper. He's watching all these things take place. And verse 39 he says, If he really was a prophet. So now he has questions. Maybe Jesus isn't who he thinks he is. If he really were a prophet, he would have known that a sinful woman was touching him. He was indignant. He was self-righteous. He was, hey, how could Jesus let this vile woman touch him? What a sinner she was. Do you know what Simon didn't understand? God has unconditional love for us. God is both merciful and just. Simon thought that sinners should be pointed out, avoided, and criticized. And Jesus knew what Simon was thinking. So we go to verse 41. And Jesus tells Simon a story. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And I and Simon answered, I suppose, what a rather soft answer. I have no other choice but to say, the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. He says, you are right. Chapter 62 of the Desire of Ages tells us that Jesus let Simon condemn himself. Because you see, this woman that Simon was so harshly being critical of, the servant of the Lord tells us that Simon led this woman into sin. And that he had deeply mistreated her. And that the two people, the two debtors in this story are Simon and Mary. Jesus wasn't just teaching that they were they had different debts of gratitude, but he was teaching that they both owed a debt that they could never repay. And the good news is, the servant Lord tells us that Simon began to see himself in a different light. Amen? Amen. Conversion is coming. Simon thought that he was honoring Jesus. And Jesus would tell him, you know, when I came in, you didn't put any oil on my head, but she's put oil on my head. You didn't wash my feet, but she's washing my feet with tears. Simon began to realize that he was not honoring Jesus at all. He was honoring himself. He wanted the prestige of having all these Pharisees and Sadducees come. While well, Jesus and Lazarus sat at the table with him. Simon began to realize that his religion was a farce. And he was touched by the fact that Jesus did not expose him openly. He realized that Jesus did not treat him the way he was treating Mary. Because had Jesus sternly rebuked Simon the leper, he would have be coiled and just walked away. But as he observed, and as he watched, and as he learned, and as he surrendered his heart to the Lord, 
He became not only an open follower of the Messiah, he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. He surrendered his heart to him. Let me tell you how that happens. Miss Thompson was a school teacher. Anybody here been a school teacher? Oh, good. Her opening statement, the first day of class, was always, students, I love you all the same. The problem was it wasn't true. Because there are some students she just did not like. <laughs> like Teddy. His hair was unkempt. His clothes didn't fit right. So he would sit and stare out the window. Now, Teddy, and the other also, he was a slow learner. He'd stare out the window and she'd bring his test back with big red X's all over it and a big red F on the top. She thought that might impress him. It would probably depress him. What, what you don't know in the story is that Teddy's mother is quite ill. And in a couple of weeks, Teddy's mother's going to pass away. His father is distant. Christmas came, and all the kids brought Miss Thompson a Christmas gift, including Teddy. He had taken a brown paper bag with scotch tape and he had wrapped a pearl bracelet and half a jar of cheap perfume. Now when Miss Thompson opened it up, the kids began to laugh. Well, she quieted that by putting the bracelet on and some of the pearls were missing. They told them how beautiful it was and she sprayed some of the cologne, excuse me, perfume, cologne for men, some of the perfume on. Told the kids how wonderful it was. When all the kids left, Teddy went up to Mrs. to Miss Thompson and said to her, "When you put that perfume on, you smell like my mother." When Teddy left, Miss Thompson was broken. She got on her knees and she pled for forgiveness and transformation. The next day, the students got a brand new teacher. See, Miss Thompson was no longer just a teacher. Now she was a servant of God. And she saw every student as a soul to be one for the kingdom. Amen. Now, Teddy and Kevin contacted Miss Thompson. He graduated from elementary school, barely. Got into high school. He graduated first in his class. Went on to college. He kept writing to her, to keep her in touch with what was happening in his life. Graduated second his class in college, went on to medical school and graduated. He contacted her and he said, Miss Thompson, two great things are happening in my life today. Number one, I'm graduating from med school. And two, I'm getting married. He says, But my father's passed away, or my mother's passed away. I have no family. Would you come and sit in the seat of honor where my mother would sit? Well, you couldn't keep her away with a bunch of horses. You see, Jesus knows every one of us. He knows everything about us. And you may think, I'm just too sinful. Or you may think like Simon the leper. I'm too good. No matter how bad we are or how bad we have been, Jesus loves us. Amen. There's no condition, no but to that. Now it's the Gospel writer John, because this story is recorded in all four of the Gospels, who tells us that this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus and, and Martha, the niece of Simon the leper. And he also tells us that she doesn't stop at just anointing his head. But covers his body with this point. Now, Judas is the one who says, 
What a waste. That money could have been used for the poor. Now, this, this perfume, think about the most expensive perfume you have ever bought. And think about what you paid for it. This nard comes from the Himalayas. 300 denarii. It's probably worth about $15,000. You ever pay that much for perfume? You ever wanted to pay that much for perfume? Nard is literally a gift for kings. It's how appropriate. And she tells us that Judas rebuked her and said, What a waste! But Jesus accepts the offering and silences the critics. Let's go to scene number three, verses 10 and 11. And Judas is a carrier who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. And the chief priests were excited. They've been trying to figure out how do we get close enough to Jesus to arrest him and then take his life without starting a riot. Matthew tells us that Judas was paid about 300 pieces of silver, about $5,000. And according to the Old Testament, if you, if you had an ox and he gored another man's slave, you would pay him $5,000. Judas was paid the price of a slave for betraying Jesus. Now Mary wanted to do something to show how much she loved him. She had heard that he was going to die. And she took this most expensive perfume. And the fragrance of it covered his body. Mary didn't, and Zion Rachel tells us that Mary did not understand what she was doing. She couldn't explain to you why she had chosen that time. But we learned that the Holy Spirit had impressed upon her to do this. Because this act would remain in Jesus' mind as he would travel to the road to the cross. It would give him courage and hope. The alabaster bottle was broken and filled the whole room. Jesus' body was broken, but when he came out of that grave, the fragrance of his life fills the whole world. We have a reason to hope. We have peace because of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus could have exposed Judas' lies. Judas was a habitual thief, stealing money out of the bag that they were collecting funds to help the poor. He was constantly stealing that money. And Jesus did not confront him there because he did not want to give Judas an excuse for saying, well, the only reason I betrayed him was because he betrayed me. And instead of listening and waiting to see what Jesus would say, Judas criticizes Mary. But instead, Jesus praises Mary. And Jesus looks into the eyes of Judas. And Judas knows that he sees that he's a thief, and he sees his, his, his hypocrisy. You know, from a human standpoint, salvation could be viewed as a waste, couldn't it? So many people are choosing to be lost. Even the angels must sometimes wonder, is, is it worth it? But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all agree that no matter what the price, the salvation of humanity is worth it. Now in this story, Mark helps us understand that Jesus is in control of the events. He's not surprised by any of the things that are going to happen leading up to his crucifixion. 
Judas thinks he's fooling everybody. But he's not fooling himself. I mean, he's not fooling Jesus. Yes, he's fooling the disciples. But Jesus already knows that he's going to betray him. And Jesus is controlling the events at the house and allowing Mary to anoint his body. Here you have Mary and the priests. The priests are paying money to betray Jesus. Mary is paying money to anoint the body of Jesus. Here you have Mary and the disciples. The disciples have had so much more instruction. You ever, been, you ever been tempted to say to a pastor, well, you know, you have a degree in theology, so you should know everything? <laughs> I've heard that many times. Mary had not had a degree in theology. She had not gone to the seminary like the disciples had. They had already heard three, on three different occasions Jesus say, I am going to die. Mary heard Jesus. And she was there to adorn his body. She gives the most valuable gift that she has. She demeans herself, even to the point of rubbing his feet with her hair and her tears. Then you have Mary and Judas. Judas traveled with Jesus for three years. Judas had been empowered with the other disciples to go out and work miracles. And now Judas sells the most precious person on the face of the earth. In fact, the most precious person in the universe for the price of a slave. Mary had less contact with Jesus than Judas did, but she valued him more than she valued herself. She gave up three times more what Judas would receive. There's another contrast between Mary and Judas. Wherever the gospel is preached, her name we remember. Verse 21, Jesus is quoting Psalms 41. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. I've always wondered if Judas would have given his heart to Jesus. What a testimony he would have had. But instead he hung himself. He had a pity party. Judas chose to betray Jesus. Mary chose to honor Jesus. Mary values Jesus above everything else. Are you sold out to God or are you just sold out? Mary was sold out to Jesus. Judas was just sold out. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of pottage. Judas sold his soul for $5,000. For what price are you willing to sell Jesus for? For a good job, nice income, good family? Are you sold out to Jesus Christ? Are you sold out to the gospel of Christ? Or are you just playing church? Would you rather be an aged orphan in South Africa than have riches untold? The choice is yours. Let's stand here as we sing 327, I'd rather have Jesus.